Right now, it's a pleasure to have Yad Jesse joining me live here in Studio Q. Welcome. Hi. Uh, first of all, congrats on all the praise uh, that this book has received. Thank you. Uh, hugely ambitious and beautiful uh, work. And, and it was inspired uh, partly by a trip to Ghana. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Yeah. What did you see there uh, that kind of sparked this thing for you? So in 2009, I got a grant um, from Stanford University where I was studying uh, to travel to Ghana and conduct research for this novel. Um, And it was while there that I took a tour of the Cape Coast Castle, which is a slave castle um, in Cape Coast in the central region of Ghana. Um, And I had never been there before, had never really heard about it before. Um, And it was on this tour that the tour guide started to talk to us about how the British soldiers who lived and worked in this castle would sometimes marry the local women. Um, And then from there, he took us down to see the dungeons. Um, And I was so struck by that, the idea that there could be women up above walking free, kind of unaware of what was going on below them. Um, And you'd never seen this castle before in your your trips back? No, never. To Ghana. That's that's interesting. We're going to explore that, I think, a little bit later. But but let's get some context on this novel. So the core of the novel, you have two half-sisters. There's Effia and Essie. So uh, tell me about them so we have some context for our listeners. Sure. So the novel follows the descendants of these two half-sisters, Effia and Essie. Um, Effia is the wife of the British governor of the Cape Coast Castle. Um, She's a Fanti woman, and she kind of makes up the matriarch uh, of the of the Um, Ghanaian line of the family. And then Essie, her half-sister, is kept in the castle as a slave before being sent to America. Um, And she's the matriarch of the American lineage. And so uh, the novel kind of alternates between these two two sisters and their descendants. So what did you learn in your research um, about the living conditions in these dungeons uh, on the Cape Coast? Um, I I mean, they're devastating. It's kind of impossible, I think, to to, um, articulate it quite quite right. Even if you take the tour today, um, those dungeons, they still smell, they still have, you know, just the grime um, and, and dirt from, from hundreds of years of, of keeping people in, in this, in this um, condition. What was your reaction to that? Uh, the first time you were in that space. Yeah, I was really angry, I think, was actually the first reaction that I had was a lot of rage and also um, just just grief. It was hard for me to um, to, to picture what it, what it might have been like for, for a person to be in a space like that with no air and no light for months at a time. I was a bit dizzy even just reading the descriptions. I yeah. don't know if it was rage, but you know, I was actually getting physically dizzy. Yeah. Um, what about uh, Effia's uh, experience marrying a slave trader? What did you learn about um, about that and how common that would have been? Yeah, I mean, I didn't even know that was a, something that happened. Um, but my, my mother is a Fanti, so she's from that that region of Ghana. And I, I was aware of certain things like um, Fanti people having... Um, British last names like York or Mills, um, things like that, that I hadn't really pieced together uh, what it might have meant for for their um, relationship to to the British. And so that that whole aspect of the research was really eye opening for me and really kind of new. Earlier, you described this pretty striking image. Um, Effia is literally living above her enslaved uh, sister. Right. And, and, and that has some roots in history. But it also strikes me as a as a eerie metaphor maybe right. for present day uh, inequality is that uh, yeah. something you were hoping to yeah, tease I, out yeah i think so you know this was the the very literal upstairs downstairs um, situation where you could be kind of walking above unaware of what was going on below you and, and kind of um, not trying to investigate what was going on below you because to have those answers um, would devastate you, I think. And so I think that is a way that a lot of us live our lives today, kind of not digging below the surface and, and kind of not seeing these truths that, that we need to see. There's a long history of slave narratives uh, in fiction. Um, I think this book is a bit different. What did you want to add with Home Going? Well, with Homegoing, it was really important to me that the novel end in the present because I didn't want this to kind of be the the kind of book where you could leave it saying, you know, slavery was a million years ago and it has no bearing on our lives today. Like I wanted it to be very clear all of the ways that that slavery has kind of come to um, leave a lasting legacy on on American history, on on Ghanaian history um, and on many other countries' histories. Not just histories, but on the personal. I, I yeah. think this book is pretty intimate. What, what did you want to reveal about the per, the legacy of slavery uh, on that kind of personal, psychological level? Right, right. It was important to me that the book um, deal with individuals because I felt like um, it 
you, I wanted it to, to, to kind of show that um, these things that happen, these devastating things that happen in our history, they happen to, to people, um, people who have, you know, hopes and dreams and fears just like we have and who are uh, doing what they think is right, um, which I think is the harder, the harder thing to kind of understand sometimes is that um, no one thinks that they're the villain in the story, you know. Um, you said you also wanted to explore how slavery and racism uh, has moved and changed over time throughout history, over a long period of time. Right. What intrigued you about that? Well, or- originally I thought I would have a, a book that just took place in the present and then kind of had flashbacks to the 18th century, uh, the height of the slave trade in Ghana. But then I was I was more interested in kind of being able to, to watch the way um, that slavery t- changed things very subtly um, over time and, and the kind of um, the kind of inheritances that each generation got from slavery. So um, not just the fact that, that slavery happened and then ended, but that it led to things like um, the convict leasing system in, in southern states or things like the Great Migration or um, things like mass incarceration. Like I wanted it to kind of be, be this, um, this, this way of looking at history through the lens of slavery. A lot of work, a lot, of, a lot of not just the writing of this, but yeah. a lot of research. Yeah. What was yeah. that like uh, for you as someone who loves writing? Um, the research was not my favorite part, um, but but it was something that that I think it really needed to happen for this book. Um, I wrote it chronologically, and I gave myself a lot of room to um, to you know close the book when I felt like I'd gotten what I needed um, mm-hmm. in order to to have it be more reliant on my imagination because I didn't want it to feel stifled. I guess by by the research. I didn't want the book to feel stiff with research. Now, very interestingly, uh, in this novel, you explore not only the role uh, America and Europe played uh, in building and profiting off of slavery, but the role African uh, nations played as well uh, yeah. in enabling it. Why was that uh, important to you? I'd imagine that struck you when you visited this this castle. Yeah, it, it was important to me because I had visited the castle, and and you know, it's not something that that I had heard about very often. But um, when I took this tour, the guide made it very clear, kind of the 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 ways in which uh, Ghanaians had been involved in, in the slave trade. And I just thought, you know, you shouldn't have to take this tour to to get this information. You know, it should mm. be more readily more readily available, and in this kind of holistic view of of the problem of slavery, should be more readily available, so that if you've never gone to Ghana, um, never gone to this Cape Coast castle, you can still you can still know this kind of history. How much is that history in the consciousness of Ghanaians? Mm, I don't I don't think that it's um, really that present. I, mm. you know, I talked to my parents about it, and and they said they hadn't learned about it in school really. So, um, you know, in America, we're we're kind of always learning about slavery um, in in our school systems. Um, some some places uh, more so than others, but um, but there there wasn't this kind of this kind of um, uh, um, emphasis on, on educating people about about the role of Ghanaians in slavery. I'd imagine this is a little bit tricky uh, for you to to explore this in this novel. Like, do you worry about um, acknowledging the involvement of African people in slavery? Uh, people getting the wrong impression from this book and maybe feeling like they get let off the hook. You know, U.S. and European right. uh, countries let off the hook yeah. a little bit. Do you worry about that? I mean, I, I do worry about that, but I think that the the book makes it clear that no one should be let off the hook, you know? Um, but yeah, I think there is this this kind of danger that when you say something like that, um, that that Ghanaians were complicit in the slave trade, that people will will take that and kind of twist it and, and make it into um, um, uh, saying that that you are kind of blaming Ghanaians for for the slave trade, which is not at all what I'm doing. Um, I think a lot of those earlier chapters in the book show that you know while Ghanaians may have been exploiting other people, they were also being exploited at the same time um, by the Europeans. And so I think the book makes it clear that slavery was uh, very much a, a largely a, a European and, and American enterprise. Um, all this work of, of researching history, making the connection between Africa and uh, Africans and African Americans, um, I'd imagine that's personal for you, not yeah. just a you know creative exercise. Right. What was it like for you growing up uh, as a Ghanaian uh, in Alabama, uh, in the United States, uh, figuring out what it means for you specifically to be African American. Yeah. What was that like for you growing up? It was really tricky for me, I think. You know, I, I was black in Alabama, and that 
that carries a certain weight, you know, it, it carries kind of like this, this fullness of, of all of Alabama's really quite racist history and present. Um, and yet at the same time, I had a different ethnic background than, than most of the black people who lived there. And so I felt this distance from the African-American community because I didn't have these kinds of cultural touchstones that they all had um, with each other. You know, when I was in my house, I was a very different person than I was when I, when I left the house, you know, Ghanaian music and Ghanaian and food and and um, and yet there also wasn't a very large Ghanaian community um, in Alabama and so in a lot of ways I, I feel as though um, I wasn't Ghanaian enough in Ghana and I wasn't American enough in America and this book was really really very much me trying to to navigate those two spaces and kind of figure out um, what connected all of us and and kind of what what diaspora really means. What. Uh I mean, as a Rwandan Canadian, I, I resonate <laughs> with a lot of what you're saying. Yeah. What what culture or um, experiences or people helped you begin that journey of kind of putting together your sen- unique sense of identity? Yeah, I think that um, that books helped a lot. I mean, Toni Morrison um, was really huge for me. I read her in high school for the first time, um, and it was the first time that I that I had ever read anything by a black woman before and writing about um, people who looked like me, and that was kind of a radical thing in, in, in my mind. And so um, I started to become more and more interested in, in African-American literature and um, was reading James Baldwin and Edward P. Jones. And, and and then um, and then reading Achebe and people like him and kind of seeing these kinds of conversations that weren't um, really on the surface and yet I felt like they they existed somewhere somewhere below. What do you hope this novel does for um, that relationship between communities between Africans and African Americans? I mean, what I hope it does is that it kind of opens up these conversations that we only have in whispers, you know, about about these differences or, or, or for people who feel these kinds of um, these kinds of distances between between themselves and um, and, and the, the other community. I, I hope that it kind of um, it kind of acts as a bridge and, and a bridge that like allows people to, to talk about these things that, that we don't often talk about. Do you also hope it's a bridge for uh, African Americans to their own ancestry in yes. Africa? Yes, absolutely. I think one of the one of my goals with this book was kind of um, having it be this way to to restore family, um, you know, restore a sense of family, a fuller family, um, to a group of people who have been so so traumatically uh, cut off from from their their family lines. Uh, I see, you know, when I look out at different different movements, different struggles for equality in the world, I see right now. Um, people drawing connections between struggles. Right, yeah. Is that something that inspired you and inspired this book? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, I think um, anybody should be able to read this book and kind of and kind of relate to it and, and see something uh, of their own family story or th- of their own um, culture story um, in, in it. Ultimately, uh, you know, you started writing this book to get a better sense, again, on a personal level of what it means for you to be black uh, in America. Right. What answers have you uh, have you come to about that? <laughs> I've I've come to the conclusion that that there are many different ways to be black in America, and that and that no one way is right, and that we should celebrate all of these ways and and kind of um and kind of open up conversations, but between among different uh, different cultures and ethnicities and and um and colors. Well, it's a remarkable book. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you very much.